on ABC News Live. There's just a lot of frustration, um, a lot of confusion, um, trying to figure out what I should do. Chaos and cancellations at airports across the country. An FAA computer failure led to the first nationwide ground stop since 9-11. The glitch kept pilots from receiving flight safety information. The ripple effects are still being felt, prompting a new federal investigation. Why didn't they go inside? Tonight on camera and in his own words in a newly released interview with investigators recorded one day after the Robb Elementary massacre, the former Uvalde school police chief explains his decision to keep officers from breaching the classrooms where 19 students and two teachers were killed. An embattled congressman who says he won't resign, even amid calls from his own party to step down. Some say George Santos is an outright liar. Eight episodes in any order you want to watch. Netflix's new heist drama, Kaleidoscope, takes viewers on a journey that always ends with the characters' timelines intertwining. We sit down with the star of the series to talk about the heist and all the twists along the way that has lots of people talking. You said you believe there are 5,000 different ways to watch. Do you think that there's a best way to watch? I think it gives the audience power to be able to choose creatively how they want to watch it and then go back and watch it again. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a busy Wednesday night, and we are tracking several developing stories. Tonight, sources tell ABC News a second batch of classified Biden documents has now been discovered. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, is standing by in Washington with more on these late-breaking developments. But first, we begin with the flight chaos felt across the country, and serious questions are now being asked after the Federal Aviation Administration had to ground all flights after a computer issue with a critical flight system. This is the first time the FAA has had to take such drastic measures since 9-11, and it came after the agency reported issues with its notice to air mission system called NOTAM late last night, and despite reboots, it was still not ready to go this morning. Roughly 7,000 flights were delayed, about 1,000 were canceled. NOTAM tells pilots essential information needed before takeoff, like runway conditions at destination airports, weather and safety alerts during flights. Aviation experts tell ABC News that it boggles the mind just how much trouble you could get into flying without this system. Right now, there is no evidence of a cyber attack. The FAA is blaming a damaged database file. Our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, leads us off tonight with more. Tonight, ABC News learning what may have caused the catastrophic system failure that led to the first nationwide ground stop of flights since 9-11. A senior official saying it appears to be the result of a mistake made during routine maintenance of a crucial FAA computer system. An engineer apparently replaced one file with another, not realizing the mistake was being made. As the systems began showing problems and ultimately failed, FAA staff feverishly tried to figure out what had gone wrong. Reportedly, the engineer who made the error did not realize what had happened. Right now, officials say there is no evidence of a cyber attack, but they aren't ruling it out. When there's a problem with a government system, we're going to own it, we're going to find it, and we're going to fix it. At this hour, airlines still trying to recover. More than 9,000 flights delayed, over 1,000 cancellations. When I walk in, it's just pure chaos. I don't like it, but we got to deal with it, you know. ABC News learning that on Tuesday, the FAA first noticed a problem with the aging Notice to Air Mission System, or NOTAM, which provides real-time safety information to pilots before takeoff. The backup system kicked in, and at one point, the main system came back too. It was over the course of, uh, of the night, kind of in the middle of the night, that it became clear that there were still issues in the uh, accuracy of the information that was moving through the NOTAM system. So at 5 a.m., officials called for a complete reboot of the system, leading to chaos from coast to coast. At 7 a.m., the FAA issuing a nationwide ground stop, preventing planes from taking off altogether, but not affecting flights already in the air. By 9 a.m., the ground stop was lifted, but the delays were widespread. And tonight, a new mystery. Just hours after the FAA's problems, Canada's NOTAM system also experienced outages. Officials trying to figure out if the issues are connected. Quite a coincidence. Gio Benitez joins us now from LaGuardia. Gio, walk us through just how bad this could have been today with all those flights in the sky when the system went down. 
Well, Lindsay, the good news is that the planes in the air were able to land just fine. That wasn't an issue. But this is critical information that pilots really do need because we're talking about information that they need before they even take off. So those planes that were still on the ground, ready to take off, they were on the runway, ready to go. They just couldn't do it because pilots need that information. They rely on it. And now that's why that that system, they want to look at updating that system for a very good reason because they need the information. Yeah, and you mentioned updating the system, I mean, because there are obviously now serious questions that the FAA has to answer about its antiquated system. It is a very outdated system. That is what experts have been saying for years and years. And in fact, there is a new system ready to almost go. They're not ready just yet, but they're almost there. And that system would have prevented this issue that we saw earlier today because we're talking about a bad file, right? A file that was replaced with another uh, that the engineer reportedly seems to have made that change. Well, that new system would have caught this and we wouldn't have been in this position if that new system was already in place, Lindsay. Well, uh, glad we don't see all the delays just on the boards uh, behind you, at least at this point. Gio, our thanks to you all day long. Now to the breaking news from Washington, where sources tell ABC News that lawyers for President Biden have found a second batch of classified documents at a different location than the first. It comes as we're learning more about that first group of documents that were turned over to the National Archives once they were found. So what happens next? ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, sources tell ABC News that after attorneys for President Biden discovered a batch of classified documents in a former office he used after being vice president, they immediately went digging to see if there were any more. And we're now told that they did end up finding a second set of classified documents at another location. People know I take classified uh, documents and classified information seriously. Sources telling ABC News the initial batch of roughly 10 classified documents discovered in November were vice presidential briefing papers, some marked top secret, with information about a number of other countries. I don't know what's in the documents. I've, my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. I've turned over the boxes. They've turned over the boxes to the archives and we're cooperating fully. The White House emphasizes that as soon as Biden's attorneys discovered the documents, they quickly contacted the National Archives, which in turn reached out to the Justice Department, which has launched a preliminary investigation. Former President Donald Trump, on the other hand, who took more than 300 classified documents with him to Mar-a-Lago, refused to turn over all the material for months, which ultimately led the FBI to search his home. Many legal analysts say that we are talking about oranges and apples here. PR Thomas joins us now from Washington. Pierre, what have you learned that Attorney General Merrick Garland could do next on this? Well, we're told the investigation led by the U.S. attorney in Chicago, John Lausch, a Trump appointee, is in the final stages. The AG has been briefed and will soon announce a decision about whether to launch a full-scale investigation and possibly appoint a special counsel. Lindsay? Pierre Thomas in the nation's capital for us. Thanks so much, as always, Pierre. Pleasure. The issue of that second batch of documents hitting the Biden White House comes on the same day the Republican-led House sent a flurry of letters to the White House demanding answers on a number of issues, including the president's son, Hunter. The House taking the first step in what are sure to be a number of probes into the administration will be joined by chairman of the House Oversight Committee leading those investigations, Congressman James Comer, coming up later on in the program. Now to the drama playing out on Capitol Hill. The Republican Party in New York is now calling for newly elected Congressman George Santos to resign after making up most of his life story. But Santos says he will not step down, and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is saying that he has no plans to take action against him, saying, let the voters decide. ABC's Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill with the latest. Tonight, the New York Republican Party calling on Congressman George Santos to resign immediately. Local officials calling him a disgrace and a stain on the House of Representatives. Congressman Santos, will you resign? I will not. Down. I will not. You guys, we're, guys, guys, we're going to need a little bit of need a little space, space here. Work with the New York Republicans are calling you a disgrace. You will not resign. Pardon me? What is your response to New York Republicans? One man standing by Santos, the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Are you going to take any action against him at this point? Are any of these allegations acceptable to you? What are the charges against him? Well, I mean, is there a charge against him? You know, in America today, you're innocent until proven guilty. Santos has already admitted to lying about his experience and biography. Tonight, ABC News obtaining the resume he gave to the Nassau County Republican Party. 
claiming he was a project manager for Goldman Sachs. He wasn't. For Citigroup, an asset manager associate. He never even worked there. And claiming he graduated from Baruch College, summa cum laude, with a 3.89 GPA that ranked him the top 1% of the class. That was a lie, too. He never graduated from any college. Would you what welcome you some of these allegations, though? I mean, he himself has admitted to fabricating parts of his resume. Yeah, and so did a lot of people here in the Senate and others. But the one thing I think, it's the voters who made that decision. He has to answer the voters. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. And Rachel, even as the New York Republican Party calls on Congressman Santos to quit, it sounds like Speaker McCarthy is standing by him. Are there mm -hmm. any House members speaking out? I can tell you, Lindsay, the calls for Congressman George Santos to step down, they are now growing louder. An additional four Republicans right here on Capitol Hill from New York are now calling on him to resign. Other Republicans say they maybe he should not be seated on some of these committee assignments. But I can tell you that Speaker Kevin McCarthy told me tonight that, in fact, George Santos will receive committee assignments. Santos, of course, did support McCarthy's bid to become the next Speaker of the House. And with this razor-thin majority, McCarthy will need the support from Santos as well, Lindsay. And we know that Santos told you just yesterday he has not done anything unethical. All right, Rachel Scott for us from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks. Illinois is now officially the ninth state to ban assault weapons. Governor J.B. Pritzker today signed the law banning the sale, delivery, and purchase of assault-style weapons in high-capacity magazines in the state. Under the new law, residents who already own semi-automatic weapons will have to register their ownership. Tonight, a major milestone for Bill Safety DeMar Hamlin. Nine days after suffering cardiac arrest and receiving CPR during a game, he's now back at home tonight after doctors discharged him from a Buffalo hospital. Trevor Ong reports now on what comes next in his recovery. Tonight, Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin now recovering at home just nine days after suffering cardiac arrest mid-game. It's an awesome feeling. Um, you know, we're just hoping that he's getting his rest and his recovery and um, as a team, we're, we're extremely happy. The NFL and fans across the league rallying around Hamlin since that harrowing moment. Well, this is the last thing you want to see. Medics doing CPR on the field, saving his life. They are intensely working on DeMar Hamlin. Today, the Bills releasing a statement saying Hamlin went through a comprehensive medical evaluation as well as a series of cardiac, neurological, and vascular testing. His doctor adding, we are confident that DeMar can be safely discharged to continue his rehabilitation at home and with the Bills. We'll leave it up to him. You know, his health is first and foremost on our mind as far as his situation goes. And then when he feels ready, you know, we welcome him back. And there's injury news tonight about the star quarterback of the Bills' first-round playoff opponent, Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tungvaloa, will miss the game against the Bills this weekend from the ongoing effects of a second concussion this year. The star quarterback initially got hurt in late September, also in a game in Cincinnati. It's not clear when or if he will play if the Dolphins do go on to win this weekend. The arena where the Miami Heat play will soon be getting a new name. A federal bankruptcy judge agreed to end the naming rights agreement between Miami Dade County and FTX stripping the failed cryptocurrency exchange's name off the stadium. The decision ends a $135 million naming rights agreement between FTX and the county. Russian President Vladimir Putin has replaced his top general in the war in Ukraine. This comes as Russia claims that they have taken control of the town of Solodar, though Ukraine denies it. Our Matt Gutman joins us now from Ukraine. Tonight, as the battle rages for a key town in Ukraine's east, Russian President Putin demoting his top commander in Ukraine after just three months. Putin showing his frustration with General Sergei Sorovkin, known as the butcher for his brutality in Syria, replacing him with Valery Kharasimov, a Kremlin insider who planned the initial invasion in February. Russia struggling to win on the battlefield tonight, claiming to have taken the town of Solidar. But Ukraine counters the bitter fighting there is still ongoing. Here, Russian soldiers can be seen coming under withering Ukrainian gunfire in Solidar. Explosions later engulfing the Russian position. Solidar is a crucial prize for the Russians, who hope to take it as part of their effort to overrun Ukrainian positions in the strategic city of Bakhmut, just a few miles away. Matt Gutman joins us now from eastern Ukraine. And Matt, we understand that President Zelensky is calling this some of the most intense fighting of the war so far. 
and the most costly also in terms of personnel and casualties, Lindsay. Uh, extraordinary casualties on both sides, but particularly on the Russian side. So you wonder what's at stake here? Why is this so strategically important? If it is strategically important, well, beneath Solidaire, that town where that intense fighting is going on right now, is a salt mine with 120 miles of tunnels. Each side is vying to control them. That may be one aspect of why the fighting in that particular part of the Dome has been so intense and I spoke to a US medic right there tonight he was exhausted he said that casualties are high Lindsay you can understand their exhaustion Matt Gutman our thanks to you stay safe over there Matt panic on a train in Paris after a man armed with a metal hook injured at least six people in an attack at one of the biggest and busiest train stations in all of Europe. Police shot the suspect and the injured were taken to the hospital. Prosecutors said that they are investigating all possible leads. Investigators have not yet ruled terrorism out as a motive. Now to the relentless storms on the West Coast. Parts of Southern California are working to clean up after flooding up north. Residents are dealing with major snowfall. Meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all, but our coverage begins with the ABC's Matt Rivers in the storm zone. Tonight, people across California racing to clean up, all while bracing for more storms that won't quit. We've had rain before, clearly lots of rain, but nothing ever like this. In the Hollywood Hills, neighbors helping one another shovel away all that mud. And overnight, huge waves in Redondo Beach as the latest storm moved on shore. In San Luis Obispo County, the search continuing for five-year-old Kyle Doan. Kyle said, Mommy, it'll be okay. Just keep calm. And that was the last word that I remember. Kyle in the car with his mom, Lindsay, when floodwaters overtook them. In the mountains, snow lining I-80 near Donner Pass. Homes buried to the second story. And in South Lake Tahoe, we met Daniel Ames. Even for Lake Tahoe, this is a lot of snow. Yeah, yeah, and, and if you read... The weather service, basically, this could be fatal. The growing fear all this snow could cause major structural damage, even avalanches. And, Lindsay, there's already so much snow on the ground here. It's basically a season's worth has already fallen. More than 10 feet of snow on the ground and counting. And that number is going to go up because this atmospheric river just doesn't want to quit. Lindsay? Just unbelievable snow there, Matt. Rivers, our thanks to you. Tonight, there is no relief in sight from the parade of deadly and destructive storms in the West. Our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano, joins us now. Uh, Rob, these numbers are really significant. Six feet of snow in the Sierra just in the last seven days in San Francisco. The past 15 days have been the third wettest on record, going all the way back to 1849. When will this all end, Rob? Yeah, well, uh, not for at least a week. And on, this, on that snow count, this is the, the most amount of snow we've seen in the mountains to date on record. So this will put, the good news is this is going to put a dent in the, in the drought, but it's coming all at once, and we got another week or so of this pattern. Meanwhile, you can see the very active here, uh, the scene in Los Angeles. This was a, a mudslide that had about three feet of mud uh, yesterday, and they're still cleaning it up here. Some of the stronger storms, like the one yesterday here in California, are going coast to coast, and that one is going to be in the east tomorrow, and it looks like it's going to bring some severe weather to, to the southeast. Places like Alabama and, and Georgia, look out Atlanta, damaging winds, maybe tornadoes, certainly thunder and lightning through the Carolinas and Virginia, and then the core of this thing pushes up into the northeast. It's a Pacific storm, so mostly rain, but there'll be wind with it into Friday morning. So very nasty and just difficult travel. A little bit of snow on the backside. While that's happening, the next onslaught of storms is taking aim at the west. Friday, yes, but Saturday, there's the next major storm. It's going to be a big one. Seattle all the way down to San Diego. Here in California, I think we'll see another two, in some places, 10 inches of additional rainfall on top of saturated ground, especially in Northern California. Two to four additional feet of snow to continue that snowpack. And with the wind, we'll probably see some trees down, some power outages, and yeah, more in the way of mudslides and the threat for flooding here in California, Lindsay, right through the weekend. Just a relentless barrage out there. Rob, our thanks to you. When we come back, a large fire at a chemical plant, the dangerous substance it released into a community, and a Netflix TV series you're encouraged to watch out of order. Giancarlo Esposito tells us about the innovative process and the new challenges that he faced creating his latest hit drama, Kaleidoscope. The first new information from the investigation into the Uvalde school shooting massacre, why the former police chief said he did not prioritize trying to take down the gunman. This is ABC News Live.
is the crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck, it's our life. Smoke filled the air in Illinois community after a massive fire broke out at a chemical plant. Surrounding neighborhoods were ordered to shelter in place, partly due to a substance released in the air, a green-colored oxidizer that police warn residents not to touch. Oxidizers can cause skin issues, even dangerous burns. Investigators are working to figure out the cause of the fire. We continue to learn more about the tragic moments that unfolded during and immediately after the Robb Elementary school shooting. For the first time, ABC News shows you what the former Uvalde school school police chief told investigators after the attack about why he didn't go inside. This is all part of Uvalde 365, a continuing ABC News series reporting from Uvalde and focused on the Texas community and how it forges on in the shadow of tragedy. John Quinones has the latest details for us tonight. The call came out over the radio. Tonight is the first time we're seeing the video obtained by ABC News of the fired Uvalde school police chief Pete Arredondo just one day after the massacre. Sitting across from the FBI and Texas DPS answering questions about the moment he entered the school and knew the gunman was still inside. When I opened it, I saw a cloud of smoke. I had just heard some of the shots, right, because they were sporadic. Uh, it was a cloud of smoke, and I did see... Uh, one or two bullets uh, casings uh, moving still. He indicates he believed they had the gunman contained. My first thought is that we need to we need to vacate. We haven't been we haven't contained, and I know this is horrible. And I know this is what our training tells us to do, but we haven't contained. There's probably gonna be some deceased in there, but we don't need any more from out here. So I called out and I said, "Get these kids out." Whatever I told them, bust those windows, get them out. But ultimately, 77 minutes will go by before Border Patrol breached the classroom, killing the gunman. And Arredondo would be fired for his actions that day. Authorities believe he could have done more and much sooner. 
John Quinones joins us now. John, has the former police chief reacted to the release of these videos? You know, Lindsay, we have heard nothing from Pete Arredondo or his lawyer for months now. He basically has been in hiding, and today was no exception. And you've, of course, been in the community as part of our Uvalde 365 commitment. What is the reaction from parents to this latest development? You know, people are relieved uh, that, that this kind of information now is finally coming out, even though it's not coming out, you know, officially from law enforcement in, in Texas. They've done nothing uh, to, to, to enlighten the people, but um, it's being leaked out. And, and what, the, what they're hearing and now seeing from Arredondo uh, is disturbing, it, it's painful, but they tell us, you know, these days, nothing really surprises them anymore. Yeah, so numb uh, to it all at this point. John Quinones, our thanks to you. Still ahead here on Prime, how a 17-hour trip turned into passengers spending 37 hours stuck on board a train. The House Oversight Committee is taking its first formal steps to target investigations of President Biden and his son Hunter. We speak to new chair about why he says it's such a pressing issue and what he hopes to uncover. And award season officially kicks off with a show that's been at the center of major controversy. We take a look at the Golden Globes by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day. Welcome back, Snoopy. That's the message beamed down by the NASA Johnson Space Center Twitter account today after this Snoopy doll returned home following an extended stay aboard Artemis One's mission to the moon and back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Come out, come out, wherever you are. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out, now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. As a journalist, I've learned it's important to grab the reader's attention with a catchy headline. Here's mine. Local woman ruins own life. You are late. Oh. But I told everyone that you were donating blood. Okay, so act kind of woozy. So, what are you going to put me on? The deadbeat. Oh my god, you're putting me on, a bitch. Where is <laughs> Don't you come any closer, I will kill you. I'm already dead. Oh my god, you're putting me on, a bitch. Where is Fun fact, you're the only one that can see me. No! Yep. No! Yep. No! 
Welcome back, everyone. The Hollywood Awards season has officially kicked off with the return of the Golden Globes last night. Let's take a look by the numbers. The 80th edition of the Golden Globes returned to television following one year off the air in the wake of high-profile controversies that have threatened the award show's existence. That includes the revelation that the Hollywood Foreign Press Association had zero black voting members in its ranks prior to 2021, as well as allegations of bribery and favoritism, issues the comedian and host Jared Carmichael took direct aim at in his opening monologue. The HFPA says it has made reforms, saying its 200 members now include 22% Latino and nearly 14% black voters, as well as three black members on its 15-member board of directors. And the awards night did have some special moments, including the first Asian actor since 1984 to win Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture, with Ki Hui Kwan winning for his first role in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. The win came 39 years after he had appeared as a child actor in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Actress Angela Bassett took home the second Golden Globe of her career for her role as Queen Oromonda in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and became the first Marvel actor to ever take home a globe. And the 61 year old Jennifer Coolidge gave an emotional and spoiler filled speech accepting her win for Best Supporting Actress in a Limited Series for her role in White Lotus. And while the Golden Globes may not be the best predictor for the rest of the awards season, they do serve as a reminder that the Oscars are now just 60 days away. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Another cost that could be going up, how high car insurance rates are expected to rise. Tennis phenom Naomi Osaka is taking a break from tennis until 2024. Why? She's staying off the court. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. making ABC's This Week, America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings.
The Supreme Court letting New York continue enforcing a new gun law. New York can continue to ban guns from sensitive places like schools, playgrounds, even Times Square, and require applicants for gun licenses to show good moral character. While appeals to the state's new gun law play out, the U.S. Supreme Court denied a move by a handful of gun owners to immediately halt the state's restrictions. The decision appeared unanimous, though Justices Alito and Thomas said it reflected respect for the appeals process rather than expressing any view on the merits of the case. New York had to rewrite its gun laws last summer after the Supreme Court invalidated its old permitting system. A Florida-bound Amtrak train finally reached its destination after 37 hours. The Amtrak auto train, which allows passengers to bring their cars on board, left at 5 p.m. Monday from Lorton, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., for a 17-hour journey to Sanford, Florida, near Orlando, but was delayed in South Carolina when a freight train nearby derailed. Further complicating things, the crew on board had timed out and could not continue, leaving hundreds of exhausted passengers and crew members to wait for another crew to take over. The train finally finally pulled into the station just after 6 o'clock this morning, a little under 24 hours after it was supposed to arrive. Five New Haven, Connecticut police officers charged in connection with a man being paralyzed while in police custody pled not guilty during an arraignment hearing. All five officers have been charged with one count each of second-degree reckless endangerment and cruelty to persons, both misdemeanors. Video from June shows Randy Cox being arrested and placed in a police van without a seatbelt and then being thrown headfirst into a wall during an abrupt stop. Cox was heard asking for help and saying he couldn't move, but officers reportedly did not immediately assist him and then briefly dragged him when they arrived at the station. Cox is now paralyzed from the neck down. The officers were each released on bond with the next pretrial hearing set for February 23rd. The Consumer Product Safety Commission says they are not looking to ban gas stoves after new research links the use of gas stoves to childhood asthma. In a new statement, the CPSC chair said the commission is researching new ways to address any health risk from gas emissions in stoves and working to strengthen voluntary safety standards. But the statement clarified that the commission had no active plans to actually ban the stoves. Rich Trumka, commissioner of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, told Bloomberg News a ban on gas stoves is on the table but he later backtracked. A new report says many car owners are in for higher insurance rates in 2023. The report from the research firm Value Penguin says rates are expected to go up by 8.4% across the U.S. The average cost of full coverage car insurance is expected to be $1,780 per year, though rates will vary from state to state. The price jump stems from a return to driving patterns resembling life before the pandemic, meaning more accidents and and insurance claims, as well as a number of other factors, including rising supply costs. Congratulations are in order for tennis star Naomi Osaka. She announced on social media that she is expecting a child. Osaka posted a photo of an ultrasound and a statement saying in part she had much to look forward to. And one thing she was looking forward to was for her kid to watch one of her matches. The announcement comes a few days after Osaka pulled out of the upcoming Australian Open. But she ended her message saying she would see everyone again at the next one in 2024. Now to Washington in the first actions by the new Republican House majority aimed at investigating President Biden and his administration. Today, the new chair of the House Oversight Committee, James Comer, issued a flurry of letters as part of the panel's first formal steps targeting investigations of President Biden, his son Hunter, and social media companies that Republicans allege suppressed negative stories about the president's son during the 2020 election. Joining us now is the new chair of the House Oversight Committee, Republican James Comer of Kentucky. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. So Chairman Comer, in a letter to Treasury Secretary Yellen today, you wrote, uh, the Committee on Oversight and Accountability is investigating President Biden's involvement in his family's foreign business practices and international influence peddling schemes. Uh, why is investigating the president and his son's business dealings the most pressing issue for you to pursue on, on behalf of the American people? Well, we're pursuing a lot of issues. We're concerned about COVID spending. We're concerned about the crisis at the border. I could go on and on. But with respect to this Biden family influence peddling, uh, this is an issue of national security. We're concerned that the millions of dollars 
that the Biden family has received from our adversaries in China and Russia could have potentially compromised this White House. So we believe this is something worth investigating. And uh, today we officially launched that investigation. So Joe Biden, just to, for clarity, he says he denies that, that he's ever uh, personally received any any money from any of our foreign adversaries, as you described. But, but just for the sake of academic debate here, uh, curious, let's take your constituents in Kentucky. Nearly a quarter of the children in your state are living in poverty. Do you think that they care more about what's on Hunter Biden's lap? laptop or about the stories that social media companies suppressed three years ago, potentially? I think that's a ridiculous question. I mean, let's just face it here. You defended Joe Biden saying that he said he had no knowledge of his son's business dealings. We've already produced emails and text messages that show and pictures that show Joe Biden met numerous times with Hunter's associates that oh, I didn't uh, were say that. I said that he said that he didn't receive any money. Well, That's all. the but. emails on the laptop show that Hunter Biden constantly complained to people about having to keep his father up. There are documents that show that Hunter Biden was paying for basic living expenses for Joe Biden. So Joe Biden's not been honest with the American people. And it's really frustrating because we've proven uh, through the emails and laptop, uh, through the emails on the laptop, the text messages, and pictures that this is not true. Just like Joe Biden hasn't been honest with the American people about the, the classified documents, the list goes on and on and on. That's why we need to investigate this. This Biden Center uh, today, you know, where the classified documents were, they have received $54 million from anonymous donors in China. That's concerning. You previously said that the Trump documents investigation would, quote, not be a priority for your committee. Uh, now you have launched a, a probe into President Biden's handling of those handful of classified documents found in his former office. It, why is investigating Biden's handling of classified documents a priority, but, but Trump's is not? I, I'm just curious if they are It's equal. a concern because the FBI raided former President Trump's house. They took the security cameras. Uh, there's a special counsel investigating him. We have now two different locations where Joe Biden had classified documents, but nothing's happened. They, he wasn't raided. They didn't go in and get the security cameras. I mean, there's this two-tier system of justice here uh, with respect to how the former president treated versus the current president. And all we know is what the pres uh, President Biden said. He said, well, there's only 10 documents in that first batch. We don't know how many in this second batch, but as soon as they found it, they turned it over. Well, we don't know that. That's just what they said. And in fact, we wouldn't even know it if investigative reporters hadn't broken the story. CBS, I believe, broke the story yesterday. NBC broke the story today. I mean, why this happened in November. Why are we just now finding out about it? I mean, there, there's just as much concern with Biden's uh, mishandling of classified documents as Trump, yet there's no special prosecutor there was no raid on the, the president's uh, Biden Center. And we want to know why. Look, I'm not saying Joe Biden did anything wrong with his handling of classified documents. But if you look at how the former President Trump has been treated versus how current President Biden's been treated, there's a big difference. Former President Trump has pushed Republicans to investigate the FBI and DOJ. Uh, now that you're in the majority, uh, when is the last time that, that you spoke with uh, President Trump? It's been a while. I haven't uh, spoken to President Trump in probably three years. Okay, so he hasn't asked at all about your committee's probes or suggested mm -hmm. what you all should be looking into. Okay, your committee plans to investigate COVID fraud in its first hearing today. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's expected to join your committee, tweeted calling for an investigation into the debunked link between COVID vaccines and, quote, why people are dying suddenly from strokes and cardiac arrest all around the world. Would you say that this is worthy of, of your committee's time? We're going to investigate and try to determine the origination of COVID-19. We're going to investigate what really went on with gain-of-function research. We're going to investigate uh, some of the decisions that were made that uh, impacted our public education system and our small business system. And we're going to investigate uh, some of the science with respect to the viruses and things like that. So anything COVID related will fall under the realm of this COVID select committee. We're very concerned about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, how it was handled, how much it was cost, some of the decisions that were made. And I think we all know someone who lost their life because of COVID-19 and we and they deserve answers. Their family deserves answers. So we're gonna get started on this. This is gonna be a very extensive substantive committee and it's gonna take a long time. And I think there are a lot of questions that Americans have uh, with respect to COVID-19 that we're gonna try to answer. It's gonna take a long time, I'm sure.
And, and Congressman, I'm curious where you're standing at this moment on impeachment efforts. Uh, we've already seen a Republican action pushing for Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas impeachment. Marjorie Taylor Greene has called for Attorney General Garland's impeachment. Do you support those calls? Well, you know, Mayorkas hasn't done a very good job securing the border. We've met with Border Patrol agents who are very concerned about some of the policies and decisions uh, being handed down by Secretary Mayorkas. Our border is wide open. The fentanyl problem is, is terrible right now. Uh, we have the ability in the federal government to secure that border, but for whatever reason, Mayorkas is standing in the way. So uh, if anyone is a prime candidate for impeachment in this town, I would say it's Secretary Mayorkas. Is impeachment of President Biden on the table? Is that something that you'd consider? No, I'm, I'm just investigating the Biden family influence peddling schemes. Uh, the Judiciary Committee would be where impeachment would begin, so that's not something I've even considered. Uh, like to ask you as well about Congressman Santos. Uh, you called him, quote, the most valuable liar to ever try to serve in Congress. Uh, we heard him repeat today that he will not resign. Uh, do you feel that the Republicans should take any concrete action to investigate him and, and potentially force him out of office? I'm confident he's going to be under ethics investigations. Uh, with respect to uh, Santos, and you know, people have asked, should he be seated? Should he be a member of Congress? Uh, unfortunately, lying doesn't uh, preclude someone from serving in Congress. If it did, uh, there, there would be a lot of vacancies right now all across uh, the the entire Congress. So uh, it's you know despicable what he's done. Uh, I've been one of the first Republicans to to call him out, uh, but unfortunately, lying. To get to Congress uh, doesn't stand in the way of serving in Congress. Now, some of the ethics investigations around campaign finance violations, that would be where uh, his most uh, uh, concern should be because, uh, you know, there's a lot of suspicious activity there, and I'm sure they're going to be investigated by many different uh, outlets. The ethics committee, I know the, the prosecutors in, in New York State are looking into that too. So there's going to be a lot of investigations of Santos. Uh, obviously, you said lying doesn't preclude you from serving in Congress. Do you feel, though, that, that McCarthy should take some action? with regard especially to the fact that if he did in fact use campaign funds to, to pay for his rent as is alleged. If he used campaign funds improperly he won't be in Congress long so it doesn't matter and, and again if, if lying in Congress got you kicked out of Congress then Adam Schiff would have been gone a long time ago. Chairman Comer we could not thank you enough for taking the time to talk with us tonight really appreciate your insight thank you so much. Thank you. Tonight, investigators are shedding light on how they say they were able to link a 28-year-old PhD student directly to the crime scene and murder weapon used to kill four University of Idaho students. Suspect Brian Koberger is scheduled to be in court tomorrow morning as second semester classes resumed on campus this week. ABC's Mola Lange has those details. As the suspect accused of murdering four University of Idaho students prepares to head back to court, new details emerging about Brian Koberger's actions oh, before his arrest. ABC News learning from a law enforcement source that federal investigators observed him in Pennsylvania around 4 a.m. as he discarded garbage in his neighbor's trash bin just days before his arrest. Trash ending up being key in the case. Police linking Koberger to the murders by collecting his father's DNA from trash outside the family home and matching that to DNA they say they discovered on the button snap of a knife sheath that was on the bed next to the body of victim Madison Mogan. If I had one or two words to describe Maddie May, it would be just an, an angel and that she was, she just made me proud. Ben Mogan speaking about his daughter Madison to ABC News and describing the moment law enforcement told him they'd made an arrest in the case. And he said, Ben, this is the day that we've been waiting for. Ben also describing his emotions while reading the evidence law enforcement say they had gathered against Koberger. I just, I broke down and I just, uh, I just cried. I could only take so much of that and I just, uh, I, I cried. I still haven't read the rest of it. The police affidavit claiming investigators believe the four college students were killed between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. They say one of the surviving roommates was awake at the time of the murders and told police she witnessed the intruder seeing a masked man coming toward her before he walked out through a sliding glass door, the roommate then locking her door. Police say later that morning, the two surviving roommates called friends to the house because they thought one of the victims had simply passed out and wasn't waking up. The 911 call finally coming around noon. 
Officials say the two surviving roommates are not suspects. Kaylee Gonsalves' sister, Olivia, saying Kaylee and Madison did everything right that night. They went out together. They called for a ride. They went to a known establishment. They did everything you would want your daughter or your sister to do in that situation. You're supposed to grow up together. That's your God-given best friend. And so we're left with not only missing them and exactly who they were, but wondering who they were going to become. Our thanks to Mola Lange for that. Riverdance star Michael Flatley's team has revealed that he is battling an aggressive form of cancer. The Lord of the Dance is now 64 years old. His team released a statement saying that he just had surgery and is still in the hospital. No word just yet on the type of cancer. He was diagnosed before Christmas. Flatley was treated for malignant melanoma in 2003. It is the high show that everyone is talking about right now. And part of the reason is that you can watch episodes of Kaleidoscope in any order. What was it like to be a part of this unconventional series? Series. I sat down with the show's star, Giancarlo Esposito, coming up. There's no such thing as an unbeatable vault. That's weatherproof, shockproof, and thief-proof. Clearly, you can tell I love Kaleidoscope. <laughs> Watched it nonstop. I'd never binge anything. And I didn't realize, even though they do give the little caveat in the beginning that you can watch this in a random order, but I just kept going next episode, next episode, next episode, realizing at a certain point that, okay, this is out of sequential order, but I'm told there are different ways you can watch Kaleidoscope. What I love about this show is that, that our, our desire for order is scrambled. There is no order, and it creates a world where all the connective tissue leads to Rome. One road leads to Rome. So this particular show, because of the character connections and because of it spanning 25 years, you're able to follow each character and get invested in their time before, during, and after the heist. It's an interesting show to put together. For me, I had to look at it like I was doing a stage play to know all the facts and then let them go. It was the moment that I had all eight scripts, blue, orange, violet, red, white, laid out on a table because I wanted to know how it connected. Have you ever done anything like this? I've never done anything like this. The first episode I, they gave me was blue. Then I had red, blue, and yellow, and I was fascinated. I was particularly fascinated about how, how I would be able to, and the whole cast, be able to chart their time in space. But when you're in a space that is inclusive of your youth, your middle age, and your old age, wow, that's a different space. So the reminder for an actor is, okay, we are now I'm 17 years before the, the event. It's the wonderful thing about this piece. I'm, I'm, I'm six days after the heist. So how should you feel after you pulled off something you've been planning your whole life to do? Leo is a master thief. He's the mastermind. He's figured out how to have this happen seamlessly. I find this particular story to be fantastic. So well written by Eric Garcia and so well executed by Netflix and their team. Um, Russell Fine, one of our directors, uh, Everardo Gout, Robert Townsend. Because uh, you have multiple directors for the different episodes. For every two, which is the other reason why an actor needs to know everything. <laughs> because a new director comes in with great ideas visually and, and may have read all eight, may not have read all eight. And you need to be a collaborator in informing them, okay, I think I'd be here. But for Leo Papp, um, previously Ray Vernon, there's a family connection. So this story is about misconnections, about missing the growth of your child. Uh, Leo has uh, a little girl in this, about becoming your parents mm -hmm. or your, your child becoming very much like you. What's the advantage to having multiple directors? Why not have the continuity of one director doing all episodes? New ideas, a different visual style. Uh, I, I believe that on Kaleidoscope, our directors really lent to making individual movies with each mm. episode. And so the, the chosen episodes that were together had some correlation, uh, but also gave the ability for each director to come in um, to have the ability to extend their vision across two episodes. So we, you never, I, I would imagine Netflix is, is very smart in how they designed it. You don't want 
just one vision through the whole piece because it, it, it then begins to maybe lose a little excitement. Um, and when you have a new director come in with a new idea, it, it shakes things up a little bit. I had great challenges in this and that I had physical things I had to do that were mm. really exciting. And uh, to me, um, having to be in water, uh, I'm, I'm a swimmer, and having to do actions in water that you would no not normally do, but through the circumstance of the show, um, having to be 40 feet underwater and perform a task without a mask or air was really pretty exciting. And, and the idea of, of, of being a thief, to me, was exciting. You know, I, 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 I remember feeling like I had to figure out how close I could get to someone in an airport without them knowing I was mm. there. And so I've toyed with that concept before, um, but in real life, it's real. You said you believe there are 5,000 different ways to watch. Do you think that there's a best way to watch? So interesting you say that. So I, I, for me, uh, I, I think the best way is to watch is how your imagine, imagination guides you to want to know. People would imagine that the chronological order would be the event um, that, that affects Leo to put him in blue behind bars. So that seems to be a natural order. You do something, you're, you, you're, you're judged, you're locked up, and then you've got to move mm. on from there. So when people refer to some kind of chronological order, um, in my imagination, it's the, to the order of the time. Um, but, you know, nothing like this has ever been done, and it's very exciting to be a part of it because I think it gives the audience power to be able to choose creatively how they want to watch it and then go back and watch it again. This is going to take a lot of work. We move now. Or we forget about it forever. What is it about, I mean, the story of the heist is like, we've seen it so many times, but why do you think that we're still drawn in? Because if we're doing it right, there's something that you said earlier to me, which I agree with. And I was very careful in portraying this character um, because I wanted him to be a good leader. And I wanted him to have integrity behind what he did. And I wanted him to be someone who cared for human life. What is it that makes this different and what do we still love about a heist is that you want that part of Leo in this time period is an everyman. I want the everyman to win. Mm. I want the guy who's struggling with his identity, struggling with making ends meet, struggling with raising his kids. I want that person to win. Let's go. And you can stream all the episodes of Kaleidoscope in whichever order you choose on Netflix right now. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, this aerial view of homes in Planada, California, the area devastated by widespread flooding after that catastrophic storm hit the West Coast. More severe weather is expected to air hit that area by the end of the week. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. the next hour we're staying on top of a few things the state that just banned assault style weapons in high capacity magazines as it tries to curb high rates of gun violence and the potential bombshell evidence as police investigate the disappearance of a mother of three this is abc news live the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready?
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. Yeah. It's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Two major headlines about gun control in America. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker signed a law banning the sale, delivery, and purchase of assault-style weapons in high-capacity magazines in the state. And after striking down New York's law restricting concealed weapons, the Supreme Court decided to leave the state's new gun control law in place, at least for now. This law bans guns in many public places and requires people to show that they have good moral character when applying for gun licenses. It's day three of the nurses' strike here in New York City, which is impacting two of the city's biggest hospitals. While there are indications that the nurses' union and administrators from the hospitals are in contract negotiations, so far, there is no deal. Musician Jeff Beck has died suddenly after contracting bacterial meningitis, according to his family. Beck, one of rock's legendary guitarists, first burst onto the scene as a member of the group. British band the Yardbirds to join the band as a replacement for fellow guitar legend Eric Clapton. He was 78 years old. Next to the flight chaos felt across the country today, serious questions are now being asked after the Federal Aviation Administration had to ground all flights after a computer issue with a critical flight system. It's the first time that the FAA has had to take such drastic measures since 9-11. Right now, there's no evidence of a cyber attack. The FAA is blaming a damaged database file. Our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, reports. Tonight, ABC News learning what may have caused the catastrophic system failure that led to the first nationwide ground stop of flights since 9-11. A senior official saying it appears to be the result of a mistake made during routine maintenance of a crucial FAA computer system. An engineer apparently replaced one file with another, not realizing the mistake was being made. As the systems began showing problems and ultimately failed, FAA staff feverishly tried to figure out what had gone wrong. Reportedly, the engineer who made the error did not realize what had happened. Right now, officials say there is no evidence of a cyber attack, but they aren't ruling it out. When there's a problem with a government system, we're going to own it, we're going to find it, and we're going to fix it. At this hour, airlines still trying to recover. More than 9,000 flights delayed, over 1,000 cancellations. When I walk in, it's just pure chaos. I don't like it, but we got to deal with it, you know. ABC News learning that on Tuesday, the FAA first noticed a problem with the aging Notice to Air Mission System, or NOTAM, which provides real-time safety information to pilots before takeoff. The backup system kicked in, and at one point, the main system came back too. It was over the course of, uh, of the night, kind of in the middle of the night, that it became clear that there were still issues in the uh, accuracy of the information that was moving through the NOTAM system. So at 5 a.m., officials called for a complete reboot of the system, leading to chaos from coast to coast. At 7 a.m., the FAA issuing a nationwide ground stop, preventing planes from taking off altogether, but not affecting flights already in the air. By 9 a.m., the ground stop was lifted, but the delays were widespread. And tonight, a new mystery. Just hours after the FAA's problems, Canada's NOTAM system also experienced outages. Officials trying to figure out if the issues are connected. Quite a coincidence. Gio Benitez joins us now from LaGuardia. Gio, walk us through just how bad this could have been today with all those flights in the sky when the system went down. 
Well, Lindsay, the good news is that the planes in the air were able to land just fine. That wasn't an issue. But this is critical information that pilots really do need because we're talking about information that they need before they even take off. So those planes that were still on the ground, ready to take off, they were on the runway, ready to go. They just couldn't do it because pilots need that information. They rely on it. And now that's why that that system, they want to look at updating that system for very good reason because they need the information. Yeah, and you mentioned updating the system I mean, because there are obviously now serious questions that the FAA has to answer about its antiquated system. It is a very outdated system. That is what experts have been saying for years and years. And in fact, there is a new system ready to almost go. They're not ready just yet, but they're almost there. And that system would have prevented this issue that we saw earlier today because we're talking about a bad file, right? A file that was replaced with another uh, that the engineer reportedly seems to have made that change. Well, that new system would have caught this and we wouldn't have been in this position if that new system was already in place, Lindsay. Well, uh, glad we don't see all the delays just on the boards uh, behind you, at least at this point. Gio, our thanks to you all day long. Now to the late news from Washington, where sources tell ABC News that lawyers for President Biden have found a second batch of classified documents at a different location than the first. It comes as we're learning more about that first batch of documents that were turned over to the National Archives when they were found. So what happens next? ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, sources tell ABC News that after attorneys for President Biden discovered a batch of classified documents in a former office he used after being vice president, they immediately went digging to see if there were any more. And we're now told that they did end up finding a second set of classified documents at another location. People know I take classified uh documents and classified information seriously. Sources telling ABC News the initial batch of roughly 10 classified documents discovered in November were vice presidential briefing papers, some marked top secret, with information about a number of other countries. I don't know what's in the documents. I've, my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. I've turned over the boxes. They've turned over the boxes to the archives and we're cooperating fully. The White House emphasizes that as soon as Biden's attorneys discovered the documents, they quickly contacted the National Archives, which in turn reached out to the Justice Department, which has launched a preliminary investigation. Former President Donald Trump, on the other hand, who took more than 300 classified documents with him to Mar-a-Lago, refused to turn over all the material for months, which ultimately led the FBI to search his home. Many legal analysts say that we are talking about oranges and apples here. Pierre Thomas joins us now from Washington. Pierre, uh, what have you learned that Attorney General Merrick Garland could do next on this? Well, we're told the investigation led by the U.S. attorney in Chicago, John Lausch, a Trump appointee, is in the final stages. The AG has been briefed and will soon announce a decision about whether to launch a full-scale investigation and possibly appoint a special counsel. Lindsay? Pierre Thomas in the nation's capital for us. Thanks so much, as always, Pierre. Pleasure. Tonight, there is no relief in sight from the parade of deadly and destructive storms in the West. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Uh, Rob, these numbers are really significant. Six feet of snow in the Sierra just in the last seven days in San Francisco. The past 15 days have been the third wettest on record, going all the way back to 1849. When will this all end, Rob? Yeah, well, uh, not for at least a week. Uh, on, this, on that snow count, this is the, the most amount of snow we've seen in the mountains to date on record. So this will put, the good news is this is going to put a dent in the, in the drought, but it's coming all at once, and we got another week or so of this pattern. Meanwhile, you can see the very active here, uh, the scene in Los Angeles. This was a, a mudslide that had about three feet of mud uh, yesterday, and they're still cleaning it up here. Some of the stronger storms, like the one yesterday here in California, are going coast to coast, and that one is going to be in the east tomorrow, and it looks like it's going to bring some severe weather to, to the southeast. Places like Alabama and, and Georgia, look out Atlanta, damaging winds, maybe tornadoes, certainly thunder and lightning through the Carolinas and Virginia, and then the core of this thing pushes up into the northeast. It's a Pacific storm, so mostly rain, but there'll be wind with it into Friday morning. So 
very nasty and just difficult travel. A little bit of snow on the backside. While that's happening, the next onslaught of storms is taking aim at the west. Friday, yes, but Saturday, there's the next major storm. It's going to be a big one. Seattle all the way down to San Diego. Here in California, I think we'll see another two. It's in some places, 10 inches of additional rainfall on top of saturated ground, especially in northern California. Two to four additional feet of snow to continue that snowpack. And with the wind, we'll probably see some trees down, some power outages, and yeah, more in the way of mudslides and the threat for flooding here in California, Lindsay, right through the weekend. Just a relentless barrage out there. Rob, our thanks to you. We continue to learn more about the tragic moments that unfolded during and immediately after the Robb Elementary School shooting. For the first time, ABC News shows you what the former Uvalde school police chief told investigators after the attack and why he didn't go inside. This is all part of Uvalde 365, an ongoing ABC News series reporting from Uvalde and focused on the Texas community and how it forges on in the shadow of tragedy. John Quinones has the latest details for us tonight. When the call came out over the radio, Tonight is the first time we're seeing the video obtained by ABC News of the fired Uvalde School Police Chief Pete Arredondo just one day after the massacre. Sitting across from the FBI and Texas DPS, answering questions about the moment he entered the school and knew the gunman was still inside. When I opened it, I saw a cloud of smoke. I had just heard some, the shots, right, because they were sporadic. Uh, it was a cloud of smoke, and I did see... Uh, one or two bullets uh, casings uh, moving still. He indicates he believed they had the gunman contained. My first thought is that we need to, we need to vacate. We haven't been, we haven't contained. And I know this is horrible. I know this is what our training tells us to do, but we haven't contained. There's probably gonna be some deceased in there, but we don't need any more from out here. So I called out and I said, get these kids out. Whatever I told them, bust those windows, get them out. But ultimately, 77 minutes will go by before Border Patrol breached the classroom, killing the gunman. And Arredondo would be fired for his actions that day. Authorities believe he could have done more and much sooner. Our thanks to John for that. Now to the drama playing out on Capitol Hill. The Republican Party in New York is now calling for newly elected Congressman George Santos to resign after making up most of his life story. But Santos says he will not step down. And House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is saying that he has no plans to take action against him, saying let the voters decide. ABC's Rachel Scott has the latest from Capitol Hill. Tonight, the New York Republican Party calling on Congressman George Santos to resign immediately. Local officials calling him a disgrace and a stain on the House of Representatives. Congressman Santos, will you resign? I will not. Will you step down? Guys, I will not. You, guys, we're, guys, 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 we're going to need a little bit of space here. With the New York Republicans are calling you a disgrace. You will not resign? Pardon me? What is your response to New York Republicans? One man standing by Santos, the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Can you take any action against him at this point? Are any of these allegations acceptable to you? What are the charges against him? Well, I mean, is there a charge against him? You know, in America today, you're innocent until proven guilty. Santos has already admitted to lying about his experience and biography. Tonight, ABC News obtaining the resume he gave to the Nassau County Republican Party, claiming he was a project manager for Goldman Sachs. He wasn't. For Citigroup, an asset manager associate. He never even worked there. And claiming he graduated from Baruch College, summa cum laude, with a 3.89 GPA that ranked him the top 1% of the class. That was a lie, too. He never graduated from any college. Would you what welcome you some of these allegations, though? I mean, he himself has admitted to fabricating parts of his resume. Yeah, and so did a lot of people here in the Senate and others. But the one thing I think, it's the voters who made that decision. He has to answer the voters. Thanks to Rachel, Russian President Vladimir Putin has replaced his top general in the war in Ukraine. This comes as Russia claims that they have taken control of the town of Solodar, though Ukraine denies it. Matt Gutman joins us tonight from Ukraine. Tonight, as the battle rages for a key town in Ukraine's east, Russian President Putin demoting his top commander in Ukraine after just three months. Putin showing his frustration with General Sergei Sorovkin, known as the butcher for his brutality in Syria, replacing him with Valery Kharasimov, a Kremlin insider who planned the initial invasion in February. Russia struggling to win on the battlefield tonight, claiming to have taken the town of Solidar. But Ukraine counters the bitter fighting there is still ongoing. Here, Russian soldiers can be seen coming under withering Ukrainian gunfire in Solidar. 
explosions later engulfing the Russian position. Solidar is a crucial prize for the Russians, who hope to take it as part of their effort to overrun Ukrainian positions in the strategic city of Bakhmut, just a few miles away. Our thanks to Matt Gutman in Ukraine for us tonight. Back here at home, we head to Massachusetts. New potential clues in the disappearance of the Massachusetts mother of three who's been missing now since New Year's. Her husband is now behind bars accused of misleading police, plus the disturbing new details about what investigators say they found. ABC's Trevor Alt has those details. Potential bombshell evidence reportedly found in the investigation for the disappearance of Massachusetts mother Anna Walsh. ABC affiliate WCVB reports investigators discovered a hacksaw and a bloody rug while searching this trash transfer station about 40 miles from the Walsh's home. The canines were in our yard. They looked in that car. The 39-year-old mother of three was last seen in the early hours of New Year's Day, scheduled to take a flight for work that she never made. There's no way Anna would abandon her children or her job. Immediately, I'm like, something is not right. She was reported missing by her employer and her husband, Brian Walsh, who right now is in jail, charged with misleading the investigation to which he's pleaded not guilty. But prosecutors said they found a bloody knife in the Walsh's basement. Overnight surveillance video newly obtained by WCVB shows Brian Walsh at a juice bar on January 2nd, the day after his wife went missing, the same day he reportedly spent $450 at a Home Depot on cleaning supplies. And he's required to report his whereabouts while awaiting sentencing for art fraud. He um, uh, was very reluctant to admit guilt, and even though there was a, a lot of evidence, he strung out things a, a long time. Court records show Anna wrote a letter to the judge in that case, praising her husband, saying he brought the family joy and comfort despite having a difficult childhood. Our thanks to Trevor. And still to come, what's leading to chaos and unrest in a South American country as protesters clash with government forces? And civil rights activist Ben Jealous tells us about the messages he wants Americans to remember about our history, our relationship with race, and the path to healing. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Tigray forces who fought a two-year war against Ethiopia's federal government began handing over heavy weaponry to the National Army as part of an African Union-led peace agreement. The conflict created famine-like conditions for hundreds of thousands of Tigray's population, killed thousands, and displaced millions across northern Ethiopia. Supporters of Bolivia's government shot fireworks toward protesters who took to the streets of the capital of La Paz to call for the release of prominent Bolivian opposition figure 
Luis Camacho. Police arrested Camacho, a right-wing governor, in December on terrorism charges related to what authorities called a coup in 2019 against then-leftist leader Evo Morales. Camacho denies the charges. Uganda has declared the end of a nearly four-month Ebola outbreak that it briefly struggled to contain but was unable to swiftly bring under control despite the absence of a proven vaccine against the viral strain in question. This was Uganda's eighth Ebola outbreak since 2000. Ebola spreads through contact with the bodily fluids of an infected person and has a fatality rate of about 50%. Though America has come a long way, the daily challenges of systemic racism still exist. Our next guest is a civil rights activist and the youngest person ever to be president of the NAACP. Now Ben Jealous is sharing his views on how to heal America in his new book, Never Forget Our People Were Always Free, a parable of American healing. Jealous explores his own family's history and weaves in anecdotes from his loved ones who have shaped his view of humanity, along with thought-provoking perspective on race relations. And joining us now is the author and professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania, Ben Jealous. How are you, Ben? I'm great, thank you. It's great to be with you. First, uh, you describe your grandmother, Mamie Todd Bland, as the family griot. Uh, not only is your book's title some words of wisdom from your grandmother, but, but much of it honors her teachings and, and her, her sage advice. How did you come to understand her statement and, and really unpack what that means, that never forget our people were always free? It never made any sense because three of her parents have been, three of her grandparents have been born into slavery. But she had said that her mother said it, her grandmother said it, her great grandmother said it. I saw my sister repeat it. And I realized this was echoing down her maternal line. And so much of this book was me digging into where did that line start? And when I found out where it started, it shocked me. And I realized I was listening to an echo of an old battle cry from some of the earliest days of slavery. Mm. You yourself are biracial or a descendant of not only enslaved people, but a cousin of Confederate General Robert E. Lee and President Thomas Jefferson. How do you recognize, uh, reconcile that, that shared lineage? You know, there was a moment when I figured out that Robert E. Lee was our cousin, I just had to walk away from the keyboard for like a week. <laughs> and, you know, ultimately, what you realize when you really dig into the experience of slavery is that there was a lot of knowledge of this just being one big family, dysfunctional family, abusive family, terrible situation beyond words. And yet when my grandmother's grandfather walked out of his house at the end of the Battle of Appomattox, he knew he was walking out of his uncle's house, that his, that his owner was his father's brother. He knew that his father's brother was a proud cousin to Robert E. Lee, and therefore he was. And ultimately, this 17-year-old who had been born into slavery had tremendous hubris. By his early 30s, he was leader of the black Republicans in Virginia. He would ultimately forge a partnership with a former Confederate general. Together, they built a populist third party called the Readjusters. They took over the Virginia state government. They radically expanded Virginia Tech. They created Virginia State, the first public HBCU south of the Mason-Dixon. They saved the free public schools. Mm -hmm. You mention this in the book. You talk about the three big lies about race. Share those with, with us. And the big one is that it's always been this way, so it's always going to be this way. This, this notion that racism is permanent. There's no reason that it needs to be permanent. Prior to about 1720, race in our country was understood as it had been for, for more than half a millennia before that, when the, first, when the word first came into Italian as raza and then split, spread throughout Europe and became race in English. That meant tribe when applied to people or genus or type when applied to things. In the around 1720, in the U.S. It, it, and throughout the colonies, it becomes a color caste system. And Africans are converted into Negroes, into a thing, into chattel, uh, and stripped of their personhood. That's something that was created. And anything we have done, we can undo. It's also important to keep in mind that the first rebellions in our country were not slave rebellions. They were colonial rebellions. They were European indentured servants and African slaves rebelling 
together in the interest of both of their children, seeing each other as humans. We can just move away from the book one second. I'm going to return to it. But just continuing along this line of conversation, uh, I was listening to an interview that, that Prince Harry recently did, and he was talking about my wife, who's black. And then he said, well, you know, she's half black. Her mom is, is black. But uh, you, we just talked about you. You're, you're biracial. But that idea of the one drop rule, that, that still remains. I mean, Americans look at you and see a black man that, that even so though the you're... cops do. <laughs> you know, what I would tell you is this, that, you know, I, I'm black. I come from a biracial family. Uh, and my black family, like most black families, have a, has had white folks in it for a long time, certainly way back. My mother, uh, when she went in the Peace Corps in the Philippines, wrote a letter to her grandmother, who the women in my family have gotten slightly darker for generations. The lightest person we know of was her grandmother. She had run away from slavery. Uh, her, her, her father had raped her mother. And she wrote that woman a letter and said, her grandmother, and said, you know, wow, the Spanish caste system, the Spanish race system, as evidenced here in the Philippines, is much more complex. Da 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 da. He, you'd be this, I'd be that, dad would be this. She got the shortest reply she had ever received from her grandmother. She said, Dear baby, thank you for the letter. You are 100% Negro. Never forget it. Love, Grandma. Uh, what do you want people to understand ultimately about race and, and how we view racism? I want people to understand that we can build a United States beyond racism and that in so doing, we will unleash tremendous potential of people of all colors. What Dr. King died trying to teach us what he died leading was a poor people's campaign. He was trying to teach us that the poor needed to unite across color lines and everybody else with them because racism was ultimately a tool of division. And that's what we forget at our peril. Ben Jealous, thank you so much for the insightful conversation. His book, Never Forget, Our People Were Always Free, A Parable of American Healing, is out now wherever books are sold. Thank you so much. And still to come, a coach who's a champion on and off the volleyball court. He's being honored for stepping up as his state dealt with a major disaster. Come out, come out, wherever you are. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut up! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. He has made helping others his life's work as a volleyball coach and a member of his community. As a hurricane survivor himself, when Ian hit Florida, he not only stepped up, but he inspired the next generation to do the same. ABC's Ginger Z has his story. Carlos is what every girl wants as a head coach. Coach Carlos is a champion on and off the volleyball court. He's very passionate on giving to the community, giving to the team, giving to other people. He's always encouraged me to push myself to be the best I can. That encouragement comes from experience, living through Hurricane Maria in 2017. Our windows blew out, door went away. So then winds came inside the house and messed everything up. I remember huge lines with 
thousands of people. And leaving my home at 3 a.m. to get some water, to get some gas, whatever I can. And then I was leaving that line like 12 hours later, doing the same thing for weeks to get uh, five bottles of water, a couple of, of canned food just to feed my family. A month later, Carlos and his family left Puerto Rico. And once they arrived in Florida, he still found a way to send supplies back. I know what it means to going through a hurricane and not knowing what the next minute is going to happen. But once Hurricane Ian hit Florida in 2022... I started feeling the same way I was feeling five years ago. It's a lot to digest. And that was my guess to do something about it. And we started collecting items and donations. We were able to deliver those goods uh, down there as soon as they opened it. I went there personally. As the founder of the Dynamite Volleyball Club, Carlos teaches the players more than just the skill of the game, inspiring the girls to volunteer through the club's Dynamite Cares initiative. We are not only focused on just natural disasters, but how we can help in many ways during any time during the year. We gave back to the community around $20,000 in scholarship for kids to play volleyball. Carlos is incredible. He never ceases to amaze me. When I think he's reached his limit, he finds another gear. We love you, Coach Carlos! Sure, he's plans on still kicking it up another gear. Our thanks to Ginger Z for bringing us that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. off that ledge and only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death if we pull this off we're set for life what do you think you're doing get out now can this be our little secret they have to pay for what they did the watchful eye january 30th on freeform and stream on hulu with so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live.